Hello, um, my name is Jeremy Cohen. I am the uh, director of the honors program at SBA, and I'm so pleased to welcome everybody here uh, tonight, this Friday night, Friday the 13th, um, which we'll hope is a lucky evening instead of its usual reputation. The Art and Politics Lecture Series is um, a ongoing lecture series in the Honors Department and the BFA Visual and Critical Studies Program, co-sponsored by those programs that aims to discuss in the light of the serious crises that we as a species generally face at the moment. Um, just to name a few, obviously, a public health crisis, a uh, economic crisis, a we've been living through to some degree a political crisis, um, uh, questions on the future of democracy, and of course a climate crisis, among other things, racial justice movements and many other things. Um, in light of these urgent contemporary questions, we aim to uh, invite scholars and artists and thinkers of all kinds, um, activists, to talk about what's going on in the world and to think through these urgent issues together. Uh, so I welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, tonight, I am so pleased to uh, have with us Frances Fox Piven. Um, Fran, it's now a, an ongoing tradition, um, her coming to SBA. I honestly don't remember how many years we've been doing this, but it's, yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh, wow. Um, yeah, Thank so <laughs> we are extremely fortunate to have that many years um, doing this because Fran is really one of, I think, uh, I, I don't know, I'm, uh, uh, I'm I Kvel, or I, I just, kind of will go on and on when talking about Fran, but one of the great minds um, in thinking about American politics, um, a person of great uh, fortitude and activists, um, one of the founders of the National Welfare Rights Organization, who's written really seminal books on American politics, including Regulating the Poor, Poor People's Movements, um, which is sort of the book to read on social movements and social struggle. Um, why Americans Don't Vote, uh, analyzing the uh, voter participation in the US, the definitive, again, analysis. Everything Fran has written is basically the definitive work on the subject. And, um, and uh, challenging power, how ordinary Americans can uh, change this nation. So I, yes, I am so honored to have her with us tonight. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to give her the floor to give us some of her reflections on the recent election. Thank you, Fran. Well, I'm glad to see you all. I'm glad to see Jeremy. I'm glad to be here. And such a strange moment. But I've been saying that a lot in the last couple of years, such a strange moment. And who among us is so confident that they can tell us exactly what it is that is happening and what the future will hold. I don't think anyone can, but let's try. So the first thing to say about this moment is that we've had a kind of victory, a victory. Uh, Biden and Harris won the election. I think, I think they won the election. Uh, and Democrats in the House of Representatives, uh, some of them were not returned to office, but those who were, were those who had strong positions on, for example, the issue of Medicare for all. Uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has been trumpeting that fact, and I think rightly so. The election was the highest turnout election in American history. People flocked to the polls. They wanted to ha have an imprint on American politics. And the election came in the aftermath of the Black Lives Matter protests, which constituted the largest protest movement in American history. That protest movement reached everywhere. You know, at this moment, I'm in a tiny town in upstate New York, and my town, 2,000 people, had a Black Lives Matter protest. 
this is Trump territory. But when I went to town 10 days or two weeks ago or so, there was a protest in front of the Army Navy store where everybody goes to buy their jeans and their overalls. So there's a lot to gain, to take energy from, but there's also a lot to worry about because the conflict, the deep conflicts in American politics have not been resolved by this election. You can tell that right away by the fact that the Trump people are refusing to acknowledge the election or to acknowledge the fact that the opposition has won. Moreover, we don't know what they're going to do to back up their refusal to acknowledge a democratic victory. Mitch McConnell still controls the Senate. There is a kind of stalemate in American politics, no matter that it was a big victory. It wasn't just a marginal victory, a narrow victory, a skin in your teeth type thing. It was a big victory and Trump, and not just Trump, but Trump and his cronies are refusing to acknowledge it. And we don't know what they're gonna do. We do not know. Maybe you know, but I don't know. Uh, so we have a, we won the election. Maybe, maybe the transition will take place. But even if the transition does take place, even if Biden does ascend to the presidency, even if his transition team begins to function, even if his coronavirus measures begin to be the dominant measures, 150,000 new cases today, we need that. We need sane policies. Even if all of this happens, the country, the United States of America is a country with deep political problems that I think we ought to think about now. One problem is that the talk of the campaign in which a lot of people on the in the center or on the left began to talk about fascism in the United States. I mean, they listened to accounts of QAnon, for example, and you had to talk about fascism in the United States. Well, we are going, assuming now that we inherit the political apparatus, we are going to inherit the political apparatus, but with a fascist movement in the country that is bigger than any that we have known. Now we've had fascism before in the United States in, in the form of movements like the Ku Klux Klan or the brown shirts of the 1930s. Uh, but what I mean by that is that we've always had a kind of native fascism uh, th that is very American and very racist. But this fascism is gonna be stronger and bolder as a consequence of the experience of the Trump administration and the outlandish uh, performance of Donald Trump himself. So we, we will inherit a country with a strong fascist movement. That's the first problem. The second problem is a problem with democracy itself, our understanding of democracy is an understanding of a, a political system in which people assess their own conditions, try to figure out how government actions bear on their own conditions and take the conclusions of that assessment to the polls with them at the next election. Well, 
it may be that modern societies are too big, too complex, too intricate, too obscure in their processes for people to adequately do that. You know, we think, for example, that Trump voters, you probably say this to each other, I say it to my friends, Trump voters are stupid. How can people be so stupid? You say to each other. Well, but how can you be so sure of what's going on? How do you figure out what's going on? You are, we are all highly educated. A lot of people are not so highly educated. A lot of people don't have the time to try to figure out what's happening in politics. This makes them very susceptible to propaganda. What, does, what can we say about a democracy in which propaganda becomes the form in which information is communicated? Can you have a democracy under those conditions? This is something we have to think about and worry about. The uh, the other problem, another problem that we have, even if we win, even if Trump allows a transition without violence. Another problem we have is that we have the Democratic Party. That has become, the Democratic Party has become our sort of people's party, our workers' party. And the Democratic Party has, is the bearer of historic problems in American democracy. Not only the problem of the obscurity uh, uh, of modern political issues, contemporary policy issues. But the Democratic Party is the bearer of the sort of deep and essential problems of contemporary democracy. The Democratic Party is riven by the conflict between property and democracy. All of our politics is riven by the conflict between property and democracy. Think of it this way. The great movement for democracy, the modern movement for democracy, which started in the 17th and 18th century was a movement of peasants, uh, workers, handloom weavers, who were captivated by the idea, by the promise that they also could have a voice in the state, in the government. They could have some influence on the, a government that carried with it all the majesty of history and the law. They could have some influence on a government that controlled soldiers and fleets of battleships. Uh, this idea of democracy, that ordinary people, this is what the franchise means, isn't it? That ordinary people at regular intervals will go to the polls and they'll pull a lever for the candidate that resonates with their culture and with their issues, their needs. This idea was very frightening to the property in aristocratic societies. And because it was, they organized themselves to cripple democracy. The arrangements under which we live in the United States are arrangements that reflect that, that tension between those who have authority, who have wealth, who, have, uh, who can command respect, and ordinary people who have a glimmer of the idea that maybe they too can control the, the authority, the majesty, and the armed forces of the state. 
because of that, every democracy in the world is deeply compromised because on purpose, on purpose, the American democracy, deeply compromised. The, the, the kernel, the heart of democracy is in the vote, the franchise, right? And the representative arrangements through which the vote is translated into authority in the state. That's the essence of democracy. In the United States, we have an arrangement where every state, every sort of subnational unit of the government is allocated two seats in the Senate, no matter the people who live within the state and no matter the franchise the votes that those people control. The consequence of course, is that a state like Montana has less, has more representation than a state, much more representation than a state like California, which has close to 50 million people. That's a corruption of the democratic idea that votes can be translated through representation into control of the state, of the government. Or think also of the court. The court has become so important. The court is always important. The federal court is the, the agency of government that throughout the 19th century blocked any recognition of union rights or the right to strike. The court is important. The court has also been the focus of the extreme right in the Republican party, try, trying to hold on to the authority that they thought they had gained with the Trump presidency. They have succeeded in gaining a commanding majority in the Supreme Court. They have stacked the lower benches of the court with judges to take the place of those who retire or die. We are in the, we have lost the court. Now, we are sometimes very sheepish and the justification of the not only of the authority of the court, but of the arrangements which allow very old people to command that authority forever. It's a lifetime appointment. We treat those arrangements as sacrosanct. Not only that, there is this fanciful idea that has taken hold among right-wing legal scholars and judges called originalism. Now, originalism means that a proper judicial decision is a decision that captures the interpretation that the historical actors at the time of the legal, that the legal doctrine was proposed, their understanding of what the legal of the correct legal doctrine is the understanding that must prevail. I mean, this is a ridiculous theory in my own view. Why should, why should the understanding of old men in the 18th century and 19th century be the understanding of the law that we Im impl implement? Uh, but we're up against that doctrine right now. And it's a doctrine that is deeply subversive of democracy. The courts themselves are subversive of democracy. They are not elected, they are appointed. They hold office for, those judges hold office forever. And by holding office and ruling 
on critical matters. They steal the power of the franchise. So So one problem, we have the problem of propaganda. We have the problem of uh, the distortions of the electoral representative system. We have the problem of the courts. And we have another kind, and, and the problems of the doctrine of originalism. But we have another kind of problem too. And that is per very pervasive. It's the problem of the tangle of rules which hedge in the exercise of the franchise and the translation of the franchise into actual representation in government. Uh, the, you, you could see a little bit of this problem in all of the accounts in the news of the last couple of months uh, about how Trump might suppress the vote. And a lot of the vote suppression that was being discussed was vote suppression by tinkering with the rules. A lot of them, a lot of those rules that were being sort of manipulated were rules that seemed kind of innocent on their face. They were, you, ha you have to have rules, for example, about when you vote, how when the ballot when the ballots are counted, how long they can be, you can vote, how many days after the election we will still count ballots. Those are all sort of the machinery of elections. But the machinery of elections can have a lot to do with the outcome of, <coughs> of elections, which is why the Trump administration was so interested in the machinery and so interested in changing the machinery, so interested in closing down the polls on the night of election day, for example, so interested in who would count the votes and on, on what terms they would count the votes. Uh, the, and there's all, there are also the, the machinations that have to do with representation. The, the legislature of New York State, for example, has rules determining who can be on the ballot, on the official ballot at each election. The, for a very long, for several years now, the Working Families Party, an upstart third party, or sort of a third party, it's more like a caucus inside the Democratic Party, a left-wing caucus, but the the opportunities for the Working Families Party to get on the ballot are determined by rules set by the state legislature. Those rules, of course, reflect the interests of incumbent politicians, Democrats and Republicans. The Working Families Party has been, had remarkable success in New York State and they are now a, a pretty vibrant and influential caucus inside the Democratic Party. However, the state legislature has moved to change the rules which determine whether a party can get on the ballot, on the official ballot. They have upped the ante, so to speak, they have increased the number of votes you have, you have to have had in the last election. They have tripled the number of votes you have to have in the last election to get on the official ballot. And they've also introduced a requirement that you have to have at least 2% of the votes at, at the top of the ballot, at the top of the ticket. So, The, you can see, and sometimes in the most arcane 
corners of politics, you can see this conflict between property and democracy continue to foil our politics. And it has had a lot to do with the Democratic Party itself. Now, I think the Democratic Party deserves a lot of attention from the left. The party, of course, did not really begin as a workers party at all. It began as a party of the big landowners of the South. And during the Civil War, for example, the Democratic Party uh, was uh, an organization that belonged to the Confederacy, not to the nation. Uh, the, but in, in the course of the Great Depression, the, there was a kind of big shift in American politics. And in the course of the big shift, of course, was caused by the economic disaster. And it was also caused by the rise of a very uh, enterprising and charismatic politician named Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Roosevelt's uh, run for the presidency on the Democratic ticket in 1932 uh, was part of a kind of upheaval in American electoral politics. The South was still Democratic, but across the urban North, across the cities of the North, uh, large numbers of working class voters split with their traditional uh, uh, allegiance to the Republican Party and voted Democratic. What emerged from this, the, the, this event and the entire history of the New Deal was a Democratic Party that was transformed. It was no longer a party of the South. It was a party of the South and the urban North. Now think about that for a moment. That meant, meant of course that FDR and, and the Democrats won a lot of elections, but it also meant that the Democratic Party was a party that embraced the racist, oligarchic, plutocratic South and the urban working class North, which itself was machine ridden. There were a lot of political machines in the cities of the North. Uh, this, this was the party that presided over the New Deal. And you could tell if you looked at the history of the party and the and the policies it promoted from this vantage point. The Southern wing of the party fiercely resisted a lot of the New Deal initiatives. And when they, their resistance failed, they nevertheless got compromises from the National Democratic Party in the form, for example, of labor laws that excluded Black people, excluded domestic workers, excluded farm workers. So, and you know, the New Deal was a, a period of a, a lot of political excitements and political uh, creativity in the United States. There's a lot about the New Deal that we should try to emulate but what we should certainly not try to emulate was the New Deal's collapse in the face of the racism of the South. Uh, so, so there are really two problems that the Democratic Party has brought to our contemporary politics, two problems that it contained that marked it. Uh, and one of those problems was the imprint of property interests resisting democratic influence, an imprint that originated with the constitution. And the other problem was the problem of the Southern section. 
the influence of the Southern section weakened the pro-union policies of the New Deal, incorporated racist principles into our social policies and so on. Now, this became a particular, or these flaws in the Democratic Party became particularly evident, I think, in what I'm gonna call for convenience, the post-industrial era. The last 30, 40 years or so, uh, when large changes were overtaking the whole, advanced economies across the globe. They were de-industrializing. The, that meant that the, the bases of worker collective power everywhere were diminishing. The neighborhoods where workers lived were no longer as dense. Uh, the old sort of institutions which were the glue of working class collective life, like the pub and the bowling alley were no longer as important and very important. The unions were losing members and losing clout. During this period, American capital, the historic enemy of the working class, American capital was beginning to look overseas, beginning to take advantage of the global networks of communication and transportation, uh, which made it possible to locate plants almost anywhere and take a, a, and pit workers in one country against the workers in another country in the scramble to press down and lower wages and make working conditions more arduous. Well, there was a, a kind of moment in American politics in 1970 when this, this idea on the part of big corporations that we have to become more aggressive in resisting New Deal policies. This moment occurred in about 1970. And it was a moment that you know you can document because corporations organized, they met with each other, they wrote memos, and they wrote memos about what they needed in order to compete on in global capitalism. They needed to roll back the advances for working people that had been made during the New Deal and its aftermath of World, World War II, basically. And those advances had to do with workers' wages. It had to do with social policies that buttressed those wages by providing protections for workers in, 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 in the event of sickness or old age. It had to do with subsidized housing. It had to do with uh, communal facilities like parks. You know, the New Deal built parks in all the urban neighborhoods of the United States. Those parks still exist and they're still where kids play. Uh, the, this, and oh, the advice also, and it became the kind of Bible of corporate lobbyists that was that they had to locate in Washington. They had to open offices on K Street and pay a lot more attention to politics. And you know, they did. That's exactly what they did. And you could see a reflection of this in the Republican Party, but you could also see a reflection of this mobilization by business in the Democratic Party. The In the inner life of the party and the policy proposals that they scrutinized and the platforms that they proposed were steadily marched away from the New Deal script.
from the New Deal orientation. They, in fact, they d developed internal reforms like the Democratic Leadership Council uh, in an effort to change the party. This is what the Clintons represented. This is what Hillary Clinton represented. And I'm sorry to have to say this, but it is also what Barack Obama represented. These were all Democratic Leadership Council uh, reformers, and they're, but they're re the target of reform was not so much the United States. It was not the financial industry. It was not Wall Street. The target of reform was the Democratic Party itself and its residue of New Deal orientations and policies and the influence that unions had over uh, the Democratic Party. We still have this. We're st this, is, this is still with us. And there are a lot of very lively young people as many of you I'm sure know, I know Jeremy knows this, a lot of lively young people who are trying to revitalize the Democratic Party. But the revitalization of the party is going to involve a kind of tortured rupture with the money sources, the money support of the Democratic Party and with a lot of old timers in the party and with a lot of their professionals, you know, the all the people who worked on the Hillary Clinton campaign, for example, all the people, these are also all people that uh, Joe Biden knows very well. We, it's, so I think that the last point I want to make is that we not only have to work for the Democrats, but we have to fight with the Democrats in order to make it into a people's party and a workers party again. Um, thanks so much, Fran. Um, uh, yeah, a lot to think about there and a lot of what's going on in my mind too. So. Um, to everybody with us, uh, we have a little time to ask Fran some uh, questions about what she has to say. I usually go first because um, it, you know, it's sort of like putting yourself in the line of fire. It's always, there's like a sociological law that everyone wants to be the last person to ask a question. So um, I will go first. Um, and then people can get in line just in the chat um, write stack, like I'm writing right now uh, in the chat. You just write stack and I'll put you in line to ask a question uh, next, Fran. Um, so, uh, okay, so yeah, there's a lot. I, I agree with every single thing you say, so it's like hard to think of what to ask. But um, I guess uh, one question, well, two questions I had. Um, one is, about sort of, you know, I think there's this, I mean, the high turnout from this election is very promising um, and is very wonderful. There is in American politics, a tendency to basically pay attention to presidential elections and then tune out generally from all other politics. Um, I think to some degree, we see that in the, the fact that the down ballot races were so much worse for the Dems though. There might be other interpretations of that that I'd be curious to hear you say, um, think about. But also I'm just wondering, you know, um, are we looking at, I mean, in some ways the, the Trump years have been um, both horrifying for many people, but also uh, inspiring in certain ways insofar as they've activated so many people to take politics seriously and to get involved and to mobilize um, the huge protest movements we've seen um, the rise of many uh, left of center politicians. So I'm just wondering kind of, do you expect there to be a kind of quietude that follows this election? Will people, you know, go back to brunch or are the kind of mobilizations we've been seeing, is there, do you think there's likely to be energy behind them? I think, well, certainly if 
Biden is blocked, uh, I have no idea what's going to happen. But if Biden and his people, including the Democratic Party honchos, if they take office, I expect there to be a lot of activism. Uh, just think of the uh, energy of young people who have just moved, of the young people who have just moved into American electoral politics and movement politics. Moreover, the movement part of it is very, very important because even though we've inherited from, I think, the 1970s and 80s, a kind of uh, idea that movements and electoral politics don't blend. You know, that if you work for electoral politics, you're not working for movements. If you, you, you're, you're really susceptible to co-opting the movements, blah, blah, blah. It's, there's a little of that, that does happen. Uh, movement activists do go into electoral politics and sometimes they're never heard from again. But the more important lesson from history and from the uh, contemporary experience is that movements are good for electoral politics. Movements enliven electoral politics. And if you, have, if you succeed in electing a movement person to office, Bernie Sanders, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, you have a voice with a very loud voice that is speaking the words of the movement. This is so energizing to the movement. Moreover, movements have to win something. You, can, you, you can't just have movements, street marches and yelling you got to win things and winning things is good for the movement. But in order to win, you've got to have people in elected office. So it's ridiculous. We need both. So thank you for that wonderful historical uh, survey, that perspective. It was really nice to hear it succinctly uh, given. Um, I'm wondering, uh, Immediately after the election, it seems the media and social media narrative uh, jumped right on progressives as the problem with why the Democrats didn't take state houses, didn't do as well in the House, didn't do as well at all in the Senate. Um, and some of this is not just coming from the media, but from the, the old guard Democrats, that, as you were saying before, uh, so how do progressives counter that? By showing the support that they have in the electorate uh, and in the population generally. Uh, if you look at the House Democrats, many of whom were elected in 2018, they, are, they have all been very stalwarts of the Medicare for all proposal. Uh, you know, we should have national health insurance like every other civilized country has. Uh, and he, th this is a very popular idea. If you look at the left or progressive agenda, they don't have far out proposals. They have ideas that really are, are, are we, we know from the survey data, ideas that are very, very popular with the American public, including a lot of Republicans. Uh, just think about it. free community college or maybe even free college. What about assistance with childcare for poor working women? You think that idea could be popular? You know, healthcare, here we have, 150,000 new cases of COVID a day. Do you think people should have access to medical care? Everybody does. But we need to articulate those proposals, show that they're credible, that we can win them and we can do them. And you know, it's gonna be a fight because these proposals are not good for business. 
These proposals require that we tax the rich. And that should be one of our proposals, taxing the rich. Thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you. I saw your talk last year, so it's always nice to um, see and hear you talk again. Um, you ended your talk talking, saying that we needed to get money out of the Democratic Party. And I just wonder, you know, what does that look like? Does that mean that we need to make campaigning more affordable? Or does that mean that, you know, new electorates when they come in need to be sort of clean of that corruption? Like, is it is it decorrupting politicians that are already accepting money? Like, I'm, I'm kind of curious what that looks well, like. Depends on whose money. Uh, the Democrat, the progressive Democrats, the dissident Democrats have solved the problem by raising very large amounts of money in very small, uh, through very small contributions. Uh, that is a credible solution, at least in the short run. In the longer run, I don't, I think we ought to reform the electoral process so that it's not so expensive or maybe so that it's free. What about allowing free TV time, free radio time, free newspaper coverage for credible candidates who have so many people signed up for them uh, for a two months around an election? And we don't have to campaign for a whole year. That's ridiculous too. So there are ways in which we can get money out by making it cheap. And there are ways in the interim that we can fund elections with the contributions of ordinary people. Thank you. Um, as going back in history, you know, prior to the New Deal, you have situations, okay, uh, where the United States was established as a settler state, okay? And in the course of history, its expansionism and its growth um, enveloped uh, territories uh, of native peoples, uh, brought over um, colonies, uh, virtual colonies of, of uh, slavery from Africa and established uh, basically the framework of governance, okay? As an empire, not as a democracy. The term democracy is not only inaccurate, uh, but it fails to give the true character of the political representation within the system. Uh, I'd like you to talk for a few minutes about why, all right, I worked in the Green Party for a good 25 years in the state of New Mexico, in the state of California, in the state of Pennsylvania. And every time there was um, an organized effort for independent and distinct political organization, okay, uh, the power elite essentially turned the faucet off so that we weren't able okay, to uh, succeed beyond the swing vote of 10%. 10% was the ceiling in which the boom came down, okay? This is not parties or in its representations of classes. I've organized poor working people for 40 years and 50 years, okay? And their voices are not being heard. They're not heard with the uh, Medicare for all. They're not heard with the federal programs that are being proposed by AOC and the others because nobody is listening to them, okay? Thanks, Martin. Martin, I'm Martin, just gonna okay. ask us to Sorry. keep moving because a lot of people have questions. No, that's okay, thank right. you. Well, there's a lot of truth in what you're saying. I don't wanna argue uh, in favor of American imperialism because I think it's horrifying uh, and I saw on the screen a few minutes ago, somebody must have uh, posited, posted a question or, or topic about settler societies. And it's true, the United States is a settler society. All settler societies, including even the more benign ones like Canada, but Australia, New Zealand, the United States, Brazil, all settler societies are societies in which Europeans have come in to plunder and exploit the native people who live there. This is, this was our, in a way, that's our original condition. 
At the same time, however, other things were also happening. Struggles for democracy did take place and some of them were victorious. What, what are you proposing when you say, when you, when you promote this expansive view of how terrible things are and nothing ever changes? It's not true. It's not true and it drains the energy and the hope and the love of the people who are trying to improve things. Um, first, I want to thank you. Um, this has been a terrific talk, and uh, I love what you just said. I mean, I think uh, keeping hope alive, I think, is so critical. Um, I have a friend who has proposed something to me which really bothers me right now, so I'm just going to ask his question that he proposed to me, and that is, do you think the president's recent moves to replace the Department of Defense personnel with hardcore supporters signals the planning of a dangerous event um, to retain power uh, under some constitutional provision that I'm not really clear about? Not under a constitutional provision, uh, but it may reveal a more bizarre unconstitutional plan to try to uh, put American troops on the streets of American cities. I don't know, I think this man Donald Trump and his close advisors are a little crazy, not very smart, and very greedy, very aggressive. They're bullies. They've been bullies from day one. So I don't know what they will try, but I think they're capable of grotesque actions, killing a look that Donald Trump has a direct, in my view, a direct and personal responsibility for the people who are dying from COVID. And he doesn't care. So I think that they're messing around. Donald Trump is delusional. He may imagine that he's going to lead the troops in an attack on Portland and New York City. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen, but I do think that dreams of that kind are festering in his head. So something I've um, experienced since coming to school was um, I was uh, raised in a very um, red county with like um, kind of terrible education. Um, some people really tried, but my, my mother's a teacher in the county um but it like wasn't enough and i ended up having to come to college and kind of like de-educate and then educate myself again because they taught me a lot of incorrect things and i was wondering um if you had some sort of like idea of what we should do how to bring education to people who maybe don't have access to it or have or have been educated on things that are like incorrect recruit them into the movements, the resistance movements. I can't think of any experience which is more enlightening, which teaches people more than participation in a movement against entrenched power. I think that's, I, I worked with various movements, but I've worked with movements, protest movements of poor tenants in New York, and I've worked with the welfare rights movement for a very long time. I think that if you were to ask the women in that movement about their education, where they learned a lot, they would, they'd have to talk about it in order to sort of figure out what the question meant to them. But when they talked about it, they would come to the conclusion that what was important in educating them was their experience as community activists, as protest leaders, uh, their experience marching in the streets, their experience taking over welfare centers. That's what they would say. So, I mean, you can't start enough schools to make a difference, but you can start a movement or enhance a movement 
that makes a difference. Um, yeah, I love that. I had a, a brief on the educational question too. One of the institutions, when you mentioned, um, you know, all the institutions that sort of distort the democracy in the United States, one you didn't talk much about was the Electoral College. And I feel it might be remiss um, so close to the presidential election. I mean, I was just like fuming the last days where it's like, oh, we're all in this like nail biter. We're all like, where's it going to go? Like, how's it going to swing? And it's like four almost 5 million people. Um, one candidate had almost 5 million votes uh, more than the other. So just if, for the sake of education, I was just wondering if you could say something about that and if there's any sort of chance that that ever changes in this uh, weird messed up democracy. Well, I didn't mention the Electoral College because everybody's been talking about it so much recently and I thought it'd be a little stale. But you know, at the end of the 18th century, when uh, the American constitution and therefore the American state was being shaped by uh, the people we call our founding fathers, the electoral college was introduced as an arrangement which would blunt the power of the movement for democracy which the revolution itself had unleashed. Now, in order to fight the British, the merchants and landowners who were the aristocrats of the colonies, they had to engage the population. They had to make it their war as well as the war of the merchants and the landowners. And to do that, they fell into, they adopted the ideas, the rhetoric of de democracy. They embraced Tom Paine and it worked, it worked. People, why, why would people join a revolutionary army that didn't have terrific chances of succeeding uh, and was sure to mean slogging through frozen mud, muddy fields. Why would they join that army? They joined it because there was a movement afoot and the movement was a movement for democracy. Now, you know, I agree with one of the people who talked about, you know, things were not, are not so good. Democracy didn't do what it promised to do. There are a lot of things that are wrong, but that movement for democracy is what has energized every important movement that has given the United States whatever humanizing policies it has. That's why we have what we have. That's, and they're not unimportant things that we have. Minimum wage? $15 an hour should be the minimum. But a minimum wage is a good thing. Healthcare is a good thing. Ask people who are sick and need a doctor. It's a good thing. We Affordable housing, those are things that we want. People want them. And if we don't resonate with the people, we have no business in politics. Um, so I think movements are great. I personally would love to be out in the street as much as possible um, if COVID wasn't so rampant. So I'm kind of curious what you think um, movements today need in order for um, politicians to, to listen to them, you know, beyond just size. Do you think that a cohesive message and, you know, a central leader is something that is important to be able to communicate to someone like Biden in a way that doesn't sidetrack him or, or you know, bring in other issues that are maybe a little bit more um, agreeable, you know? Well, I think that movements know how to talk and to yell and they know, they know how to communicate. Uh, they're good at that. Look at Occupy, I'm uh, Occupy. They had communication geniuses at Occupy as far as I'm concerned. 
But I think what movements sometimes are not so good at is doing what is really essential to movements, making trouble. Movements have to disrupt the regularities of everyday life, of institutional procedures. They have to have leverage. They have not just good songs, good slogans. They have to have muscle. And that muscle comes when they figure out how to throw a monkey wrench into institutional arrangements. Now, it's true that a lot of people, when you begin to talk that way, a lot of people say, you know, kind of not nice way to talk. And can't you think of more peaceful, smoother ways of achieving your goals? I don't think so. Too smooth, no goals. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. This has been fabulous. Um, and I have a question that goes back to the basic theme that you started out with, the uh, dichotomy between property and democracy. And I'm wondering what, how movements can roll back the power or start to roll back or whatever, roll back the power of the big corporations. Um, they have such lobbying power. They uh, don't pay their fair share of taxes. And going way back to uh, the 19th century, they have the legal status of persons, which I think is a problem too. Those are all problems. <laughs> but you know, people, ordinary people have power too. They just a lot of the time they don't know it. That power is in a way hidden from them. Uh, so, and the power that we have uh, is the power that comes from the fact that we do in our everyday work, in our everyday routines, we perform in ways that are essential for American institutions. You know, if you think about it, what is a society? It's a system of intricate cooperation. You go to work, the babysitter comes so that you can go to work. Uh, you go shopping, you have to stop at the red light. And it works. That's what societies are. They're systems of cooperation. Now in a system of cooperation, Everybody has to do, play their role, do their bit. They have to do the cooperative things, but sometimes people don't. And they don't when they get enraged, when they begin to see that their needs are not being met. And they get angry that some people are taking all of the wealth or all of the crops or all of what is good in life and they're leaving nothing for us. And when they get angry enough, if they have some glue, some collective uh, connections, when they get angry enough, they protest, they strike, they withdraw cooperation. That's how movements win. It's not the songs. It's not the marches, those are nice. They draw a lot of people to the movement. I love them, but it's the disruption caused by defiance. And that's important because that's exactly what sympathetic people criticize. They say, oh, I love what you're doing, accepting, why did you have to stop traffic? But that's the only way they pay attention. Um, on that note, uh, I think we're going to have to call it a night. Um, please join me again in thanking Frances um, for her always uh, sharp analysis of what we're facing and uh, how to change it and how every one of us can continue to be involved um, because 
you know, what got us to 2016 is not over. Um, and uh, we only have further struggles ahead, um, especially regarding the climate, uh, which maybe we can talk about next time. Um, so just briefly, the last thing I'll do is a um, little bit of uh, let you know the next session of the Art and Politics Lecture Series is um, on Friday, December the 11th at 7 p.m. with Christopher Graves, um, a really accomplished photographer who's gonna be speaking about race and place in contemporary American photography. Um, so make sure to be here for that, uh, December 11th. And again, thank you so much, Fran. Um, and everybody have a good night. Thank you all. Goodbye. <laughs>